is to win souls for Christ, to teach the Great Commission to a lost world. If that wasn't the case, God would have just saved us and took us to heaven. Uh, because we're here, we are to continue the work of Christ as he sits at the right hand of the Father. So uh, our commitment to the lost uh, is critical. It's critical because uh, there are people who are dying minute by minute, uh, destined to Satan and, and hell. hundred people die every second. And that's possibility of a hundred people going to hell every second. Uh, we've got a commitment to do. All right? So uh, we're going to gird up and get ready to go and, and get, get the job done. Amen? Amen. So today we're going to encourage uh, our hearts to that gospel call, uh, the great commission that God has left for us to do. And we're going to be encouraged by the word of God this morning. You ready to be encouraged? Yes. Amen. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful day, this day that we have never seen before, and when it's over, we will never see again. May we get all that we can from this day, uh, not only the blessings, but to be a blessing. Uh, we are here to give all that we can give. Uh, unto you that you will be glorified and we'll all be edified by your word and by your strength. We thank you, Lord, for bringing us here today. Uh, we're thankful to have this privilege, and it is indeed a privilege to hear your word and not just be hearers but doers. So encourage our hearts today as your word goes forth that we may all receive our, our portion in due time. We will be careful to give you glory, honor, and praise. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. We're continuing on the theme for this month of evangelism. And... Uh, this will be the last lesson of this series from the theme component. But we're always evangelistic in our outreach, aren't we? Uh, we don't need a special day or week or month to be evangelistic. We just put a bigger emphasis on it this month. Okay? And as we finish up this theme... Um, we're looking forward to what God has to say to us today. Uh, thankful for all the men who have led in the service thus far, and we're just so thankful for them and what they mean to us as they've led us uh, in our worship to this point. Um, what are some of the qualities of an evangelistic church, a church that really reaches out, a church like the church in the first century uh, that won so many souls to Christ in just a short period of time. Remember when the church was established, 3,000 folk were saved in one day. Uh, what are some of those qualities that uh, allowed the word of God to be uh, taught to the people and for them to follow in obedience. And the first characteristic we're going to find is prayer. Pray in church. Uh, go make some moves in this world. Uh, the pray in church is important and critical because it, it, it communicates with God those things that he wants us to know and those petitions that we give to him. 
a communication with someone who's special to you. And God should be our best friend. Amen. Uh, what a friend we have in Jesus. Amen. And so our communication with him should be regular. It's critical to do that. Amen. Uh, something uh, that you care about, you spend time with. Is that right? And so spending time with the Lord is paramount in our lives. Amen. Chapter 4 of the book of Acts, uh, verse 29 and following, gives us the impetus of what the early church was like. A strong prayer life. Chapter 4, starting with verse 29. And this was their prayer. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness that we may speak your word. Amen. That's good enough right there, isn't it? Uh, that should be our prayer every day. Verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with what? Boldness. God is calling for people with a boldness, a spirit of boldness, to speak his word to a lost generation. Is that all right? And so in our prayers, uh, don't forget to ask God for some of that. It's plenty to go around. And, 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 and that should be something that we are seeking to do before our feet hit the floor when we get out of bed. Lord, give me some boldness today. Be meat for the master's use. And to be all that you would have me to be today with all boldness. And... If we are to be the church that God is calling for in these last and evil days, uh, prayer has to be paramount in the lives of God's people. Is that all right? Uh, these people uh, 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 had this type of relationship with God. Uh, being a Christian during this time wasn't easy. It was it wasn't an easy thing to be a Christian. Uh, people were beaten for preaching the word of God. Uh, uh, Stephen was killed in Ch Acts chapter 7. James was killed in Acts chapter 12. Uh, these kinds of things went on all the time. And yet these people remained on fire for God despite the threats that they dealt with on a daily basis. Kind of much like what's going on in certain parts of the world today where Christians are being killed uh, for their profession of Christ. Amen. Let's look at some of, the, some of what took place in the growth of the church. Let's look at Acts 2, 41. Acts 2.41, then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added unto them. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added Amen. to the church daily those that were being saved. Look at chapter 4 and verse number 4. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of them came to about 5,000. Lord have mercy. Chapter 5, verse 14. And believers were increasingly added 
to the Lord multitudes, both men and women. Luke was counting earlier. But it got so many, got to the point where so many people were being saved. He just said, well, forget about the number. It's multitudes. Stop counting. Just too many people to even be bothered with numbers. We've got multitudes now. So we move from numbers to multitudes. Chapter 6 and verse 7. Then the word of God spread. And the number of the disciples, what? Multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. One more, chapter 8 and verse 6. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles that he did. And we could go on and on just to show you how the growth just continued because the word was being preached. Okay? All right? And, and it should be our belief today that as we grow the church, uh, multitudes can come to the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The growth of the church was great. But growth is just not, all, not always about numbers, is it? It's not always about numbers. It's about our growth in a spiritual manner, okay, all right? Many of us seek to grow, as 2 Peter 3.18 says, grow in what? The grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's a spiritual growth. That's a, a, a desire to, to know more about God and his word. 1 Peter 2.2, 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may what? Grow thereby. So spiritual growth is critical in our lives. So we shouldn't be content with what we know because there's always something to learn about our God. And we can never be content with thinking that we've got it made and that we know all there is to know about the word of God. Let's get back to Acts chapter 4, and let's look at a set of verses that shows where the church was at this time. Acts 4, 32. Acts 4, 32. Listen to what was going on. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart. And one soul. Amen, somebody. Amen. Neither did anyone say that any of these other things he possessed was his own. Right. But they had all things in common. That's a beautiful church, isn't it? Amen. With great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Amen. And great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought them, brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet and they distributed to each as everyone had need. And Joseph, who so also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought it, the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. What a beautiful church. Amen. Anybody who lacked anything didn't have to worry about it because somebody in that assembly would take care of it. Okay. And so we had a church of folk who are one accord, 
one soul, one mind, together in the Lord. Oh, don't you long for a church like that today. But as soon as you think everything is all right, here comes Satan. And Satan doesn't like for the church to be on one accord. Satan likes to start some mess in the assembly of God's people. Because mess divides folk. Mess creates problems. And so when you're not on one accord, you're on all kind of accords. Everything crazy. Everything is a mess. So here comes Satan. Don't like the church being unified. Hmm, think I'll bring some cancer and put it in the midst of the people. So he raises up a husband and a wife who thought they had it going on. They decided that they were going to create some division, some problems, and lied. Didn't have to, but lied because they wanted to be all that. Okay? They had possessions and sold it, but lied about it. Didn't have to, but they lied. And lying creates problems because the word of God said liars will have their part of the lake and fire and brimstone. And lying ain't a good thing. Okay? One of the first things we try to teach our children, don't lie. Tell the truth. It's going to catch up to you. One of the kids said, told, asked me the other day, well, if I tell the truth, I'm going to get in trouble. Well, you'll get in more trouble if you tell a lie. Yeah. So, tell the truth. Okay? Because here's what's going to happen. If you grow up being a liar, nobody's going to ever be able to trust you. Because everything that come out your mouth, people are like, are you telling the truth? Or what? I don't know. And can't nobody trust you. Liars and thieves, nobody wants to be around. Because as soon as something's missing, they're looking at you. Because you're a thief. So, the cancer is in the church now. And God can't have that. He ain't going to cut cancer out. You're not going to mess up the church, Satan. So he executes Ananias and Sapphira on the spot. Ananias lies and pow, down you go. Wife come in, think they had the story concocted. Hours later, here come wifey. She gonna tell the same story. Peter and the apostle said the same men that carried your husband out of here are about to carry you too. And voila, they were gone. Because cancer will kill a church. And God won't, wasn't having it, so he got rid of it. Now, here is the question. How many of us be sitting here today if God still executed in that way? How many folk would be sitting here today if God executed that way. Well, in Corinth, Brother Yukon, some people died, didn't they? 1 Corinthians 11.30, right? Some of you are weak, sick, and some of you sleep. God executed folk who made a mockery out of the communion, got rid of them, and why? They were gone too. Now what? if he did that today. Here is the deal. God still wants a pure church. And because he doesn't execute on us like he did in times past, doesn't mean we're supposed to walk around with an impure, unholy lifestyle. Because he still wants a pure church. And the second word 
and characteristic of an evangelistic church is one with purity, one who prays, and one who's pure. Now, it got rid of folk who weren't pure because the conversation was, man, I can't go down there. Because, you know, I don't always tell the truth. You know what I'm saying, bro? You know what I mean? Like, you know what I'm trying to tell you, bro? You know what I'm saying? Think I'll find another place to go. Because liars get zapped down there. So, God wanted the church clean and pure and got rid of everything that was contributing to a cancer that would kill it. So he got rid of it. And it's incumbent upon all of us to live a life of purity so that our church can be what God wants it to be. Now, you say, well, how the church going to grow if folk getting zapped? Well, the church going to grow because that's how you get rid of all folk who are fake. Fake Christians don't last in a church where you get zapped. Because if you're on the fringes and you want to be phony, you want to be sometimey, you don't want to be a true Christian, a real Christian, you run up in here and wham, you're gone. So what happens is those kind of folk don't show up. Now the church is pure and clean because those people are gone. Well, that gets rid of people, right? No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. When God gets rid of folk who are phony, people getting carried out of here, then you get a church full of real Christians. And people who want to be real Christians want to be around real Christian folk. So instead of leaving, you're glad to come because the church is right. The church is right. Look at what happened. Chapter 5, verse 11. And great fear came on among all the church and among all who had heard these things. They were like, man, you can't go up in there acting crazy. Because it ain't a good day. Did you hear about what happened to Ananias and Fire? They got carried out of there. I don't know, Sister Pookie, Brother Pookie, Shank Shank. Y'all might want to stay up out of there. Because people get carried out of there. Well, look at verse number 12. And, though, and through the hands of the apostles... Many signs and wonders were, were done among all the people. And, the, and they were with one accord on Solomon's porch. What does that mean? That means the folk who were, who were really serious about the Lord got together. Said, hey, man, look, we don't want to be like Ananias Sapphira. So who's in this for real? Who's in this to do right? Okay? Any, who's here? Yeah, raise your hand. All right, we all together? Yeah, because if we're going to do this church thing, we got to be on one accord. We got to be right, okay? So who's involved? Who wants to be right? And they all agree, I'm good. Let's go. Let's get this done. And the phony folk went somewhere else. Okay. Amen walls and electric lights. Any way. Right? See, when we convert folk out the world, they want to be a part of a church that's right. Because they already in mess outside the church. 
So when you convert them, they don't want to come into a church with mess because they just left mess. They don't want to come into mess. So you, you, you're going to win people who want to be here. How sad would it be you convert somebody and they come into a church with mess and they're like, I just left this. Where they do that at? So, so, so the church needs to be pure and clean. So when we convert folk, they want to be a part of something that's right in the sight of God. They are looking for righteousness. If not, they would have never come into church in the first place. So that's what they want. So the church is going to grow when you get rid of the riffraff and the phony and the fake folk. Because it's going to draw people. People who want to be real Christians will want to be a part of an assembly of people who are trying to be real for the Lord. So the growth will take place. I'm going to tell you something. The day is coming. You know, I, I, I'm going to be like Martin Luther King right now. I may not be here with you, but we as a people will get to the promised land. Okay? Now listen. So, if something going to happen. It's going to be great. Okay? Growth is going to take place in this assembly of God's people. Just waiting to happen. Folk are on the edge and looking for the church of Christ and the truth in the church. They, they can't wait. Now, here's what's going to happen, right? On Sundays, what's going to happen one of these days is that folk are going to be standing outside in a line around the corner down the hill trying to get in here. Okay? It's going to be like Black Friday. <laughs> Black Friday. When folk get in a tent, Amari, and sleep overnight so they can be the first one to get the big screen TV. Okay? It's going to be like Black Friday. Folk going to be out in the, t in the parking lot in tents waiting to get in here. All right? It's going to happen. All right? And other folk will be like, what's the line for what they're giving away? They're giving away clothes in there, food, school supplies. No, the word. They're giving the word away. We're giving the word away. And come get some of this word. And that's what's going to happen. Now, you can be late if you want to, all right? You ain't gonna, you're not going to only miss communion. You're going to miss a seat. Show up at 11 o'clock if you want to. You won't have a seat. You'll be sitting in the fellowship hall because a uh, uh, Merv will put a camera out there so you can have, a, have worship in the fellowship hall. There ain't going to be no seats in here. No. And it's going to get to a point where there'll be a camera in this parking lot and all the cars are going to park over here because that's going to be full and that's going to be full of folk who come at 11 o'clock. Now you want a seat, you better get here for Sunday school so you can get your seat. That's what's going to happen. The growth of the church is going to take place. And, and, and you don't believe that. You haven't talked to Mark yet. Okay? It's going to happen. It is going to happen. You haven't talked to Clark and Brenda. It's going to happen. The things they're doing in the community is going to bring folk to, bring folk to Christ. It's going to happen. Lots of things that are going on. It's coming. It's coming. And... Don't be left out. We're going to make concessions for our seniors, say they seats, but the rest of y'all jokers are going to be out there in the some fellowship hall. Okay? That's what's going to happen. Right? So we got a praying church and a pure church. Now we got a church with some power. Number, number three, the, 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 the third P word is power. Let's look at Verses 13 and following in chapter 5. Yet none of the rest dared to join them, but the people esteemed them very highly. Okay? We've talked about all that already. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes, both men and women. 
And they that brought sick out into the streets and laid them on, on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. And a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Power of the Lord working through his people. Now, I'm going to say something, and I'm not going to stay here long, but I need to mention a couple things because we may have a couple visitors who are got some questions. All right? I'll mention a couple things, and we can continue the conversation uh, after worship if you re need some more of this. Uh, Brother Floyd will go get us some chicken from Popeye's <laughs> and some mashed potatoes and biscuits, and we'll sop biscuits and gravy in the back and have a Bible study, not an argument, a Bible study, not a debate, but a Bible study. Okay? We're going to do that. This power business. Now, here's what happened, and I'm going to tell you how that translates today. Okay? Peter and the apostles. Remember that. Peter and the apostles. The uh, apostles. I mean, hold on to that thought. Okay? Uh, Peter and the apostles uh, 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 were doing wonders and signs and miracles to the people who were sick. Okay? And, 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 and they believe that Peter didn't even have to lay his hands on him. If his shadow just walked past the Yukon, they would be healed. Okay? All right? It's Peter and the apostles who were doing this work. Why were they doing this? Because at that time in the apostolic age, all right, we didn't have a completed Bible. Okay? So, so if somebody claimed to be a, 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 a man of God and would show up, I, thus said the Lord, I have a word from the Lord. And well, how do we know? They said, well, here's signs and wonders to confirm what we are teaching so you know that we are men of God and not phony. Okay? It's the apostles. What, are you, what apostles? Doesn't the word apostle mean one cent? Yes, it does in the technical sense. It does mean that. We're talking about the, 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 the men that God picked in Matthew 10. The original 12 apostles, okay? And then later, we'll see in a minute, Matthias was added to replace Judas, who committed suicide. We had Barnabas and Paul that we know about as the apostles. They were endowed with signs and wonders, abilities to confirm the word of God. Okay? Now, apostle. Critical. Understand that. Hold, hold Acts 5. Look at 2 Corinthians 12.12. 12. Okay? 2 Corinthians 12, 12. Don't lose Acts. Okay? 2 Corinthians 12 and 12. Here you go. You all ready? Truly, the signs of a who? An apostle. Were accompanied among you with all perseverance in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. The sign of a apostle. Right. That, that differentiated him from anybody else right. who might have been claiming to be a man of God. Okay? Signs of an apostle. Now, go back to Acts chapter 1. When the apostles were replacing Judas who had committed suicide, okay? All right? So they had to pick somebody to replace him, okay? Now, chapter 1, verse 21, the, the, the real narrative starts a few verses earlier, uh, but 21, therefore these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord, 
uh, went in and out of, from among us. Now, get this verse. Beginning from the baptism of John to the day when he was taken up from us, he being Christ, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. You couldn't be an apostle unless you fit that category. So when all that happened, all right, somebody who claims to be an apostle today, and there are many who do, you need to check their birth certificate. Because they would be about 2,000 years old. A friend of mine's auntie, who is the oldest living American to date, is 114 years of age. That's a long way from 2,000. Okay? Right? Anybody who claims to be an apostle from the original intent of God is not telling you the truth because the scriptures bear that out. Amen. So, the power. What power then exists today? The power of the new birth. The power of salvation. That's the power now that we see. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? Because there's a power of God unto salvation to those who believe, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Okay? Uh, uh, the baptism into Christ, he who is baptized into Christ, has put on Christ. Anyone in Christ is a new creature or creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. The miracles today are because of the regeneration of man. You get become a new creation in Christ. A dead man now is alive in God. The power of salvation is what we seek today to save men because that's what God wants us here to do. Amen. Now, when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part will be done away with. Once the word got confirmed and the last apostle died out, John on the island of Patmos, he wrote the gospel of John. 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the book of Revelation, when that was done, the word was confirmed and completed. Now by when you read, when you read the word of God, you know the power of God unto salvation. Yes, sir. So the power of the Lord still exists today. But saving mankind Nothing else can do that but the word of God. What more power do you need than that? So, them folk telling you all those things, you now have scripture to verify that what they do is not true. Okay. Last P and we're going to be done. Persecution. We've had a praying church, a pure church. Okay, a powerful church, and now a church that deals with persecution. Why persecution? It hurts. It's tough. But that's what happens to God's people. And there is a great as our reward in heaven for how we endure the persecution. Whenever a church like this exists, it makes waves in the world. People know about the church, but it upsets Satan in a big way because he's the prince and the ruler of this world. Okay? Now, Satan used to be an angel in heaven, okay? But he wanted to be like God. So God says, no, out of here, you're gone. <laughs> then he got booted out, and according to Revelation 12, 4, 
took a third of the angels with him. Okay? Booted out of heaven. Okay? Now, you can find Revelations quick, so let's do Revelation 20. Revelation 12, verse 9. Revelation 12, verse 9. Let me just read that verse. 12, verse 9. Okay? Revelation 12, verse 9. So the great dragon was cast out, the, the serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the world, the whole world. He was cut out, he was cast out to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Okay? Now, Paul tells us, you got to watch the world, because the world will mess you up. He said, you know, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay? So the world is an enemy to God. Amen. So when, 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 when the church goes into the world and starts plucking people out of the world and, and bringing them into the body of Christ, Satan gets irritated with that. And his response to that is then, I'll make you pay, I will create persecution, and we'll see what happens then. And that's what he does. He gets irritated, and he brings about a persecution on God's people. You continue to read in Book of Acts, you'll see the persecution. You know, the constant jails, uh, 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 prisons that people were in, the deaths, and all of those things, that persecution that took place. The challenge of evangelistic church is how we react and deal with persecution. Now, the problem with Satan is that he doesn't know everything. He doesn't know everything. He's not omniscient. If he was, he would have knew where the baby Jesus was, and he wouldn't have had to kill all them kids to try to catch Jesus in the mix. See, he don't know everything. Okay? All right? And what he doesn't know is this. Every time, not every time, but every time, every time he come with some mess in your life, God is going to take it and flip it and do something fantastic with that persecution so he can get the glory from it. Amen. Now, if you don't get anything else today, understand that. Whatever going on in your life today, however hard it is on you, okay, remember, God is going to take it and flip it and get some glory from it. And if you can handle that, you will have the right perspective. Yes. How many times have you heard that this year? Perspective. All right? And you're going to keep hearing it too. Because when we get the right perspective on all this stuff, we're going to handle it the way God wants us to. Okay? So hang in there. Hang in there. Let me tell you something. It, 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 it's it's going to be tough on us. 2 Timothy 3.12, all that live godly in Christ Jesus will what? Suffer persecution. It's going to happen because that's how Satan deals with us. When we try to be pure, powerful, a praying people, then he's going to say, I'm going to get you. So he'll come up with some way to put a persecution on you. Okay? Now God allows that because Satan wants to destroy us with the persecution. God wants to develop us. Okay, all right, understand that, all right? Y'all hanging in there, y'all all right? Okay, so let Satan do whatever he's going to do to you. Take it will willfully and willingly, all right? And then just realize, I don't know what's going to happen, but God about to do something great in my life. And there's going to be some glory for him, and I'm, gonna, I'm signing up for that. Okay, that's what true Christians do need to be getting to and growing to, okay? If you're not there yet, that's the growth we're talking about today. You got to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and he wants us to grow our 
perspective. So what happens? Some of you are despised on your jobs. Folk don't like you on your jobs. Because here she come talking about that Jesus stuff. Don't want to hear all that. They avoid you. Don't invite you to nothing. Don't bring you no, you, don't bring you no donuts when they bring everybody else on. You know, they, they, it just, it, it, it's just tough on you. Some of y'all go through some of that. Some people deflame your character because they're trying to hurt your feelings. But let me tell you something. Unholy people don't like being around holy Christians. Okay? Holy people will get a reaction from Satan. So here is where we're at. Let's look at a few verses to help you get through some of this. Okay? Don't lose acts. Okay? Now, if you were in Revelation... A minute ago, we could just turn back a couple pages to 1 Peter. Let's look at 1 Peter 2 and verse number 20. Yes, 1 Peter 2, 20. For what credit That's right. is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? Uh, but when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. See, sometimes we get stuff put on us that we don't deserve. Okay? Folks say things, do things. And Peter says, you know what? That's part of the, part of the territory. But, but God is all right with that. And God's going to take it. And get some good from it. Chapter 3, verse 17. For it is far better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. It's God's will that we do this. Okay? It's God's will that we do this. Chapter 4, verse 14. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Don't we want some of that, y'all? Okay. On their part, he might be blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. See, again, whatever happens to you, God's going to take it and flip it so he can be glorified from it. And so as Christians, we ought to be signing up for that. That ought to be something that we want to be a part of because he does that through our lives. Okay? He does that through our lives, which means we endure it. And at the end of the day, the glory of God rests in us and through us because of what we have done on behalf of Christ. That's what happens. Okay? Your spouse is not your persecution. Your kids are not your persecution. Let's make that clear. In the context that we're talking about, it has to do with your, your witness for Christ. Okay? It has to do with how you live your life. For Christ. And, and you get ridiculed and talked about and, and people want to say things and do things because of the envy that they have of you, the hatred that they have for God's word, and they take it out on you. That's the problem. Okay. It's tough for you to handle that one. Okay. We're going to keep it moving. Now, is it going to get any better? No, it won't. It won't. 2 Timothy 3.13. Evil men and impostors will grow what? Worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. In other words, no, it gets worse. Okay? It gets worse while we're on this earth. Okay? But great is our reward in what? Heaven. Okay? And so there is a, there is a delayed reaction in this. 
that we, we're going to get a great reward for what we do for Christ. Okay? All right. Don't y'all, don't y'all go to sleep yet. Hold on. About done. It is not going to get any better. So let's look at some of the persecution, then we'll be done. Okay? Back to Acts. And it, this, this is all going to make sense. Okay? It's going to all be clear. And man, wait till you see what God has for us. Okay, chapter 5 of Acts. We're back there, and watch what's going on here. So here comes the persecution, 517. Then the high priest rose up. That don't mean he just got out of bed. They, they, were, in, they, were, they were really, really mad. And all these things who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation. They were mad. What were they mad about? Because Peter and the apostles were healing folk. The word of God was being preached. And people were lives were being changed. And so they are upset. Okay? And they laid hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. Okay? Put them in jail. And I guess they thought that was going to be the end of the deal. But what they didn't know is that jail is a place that God has done some of his greatest evangelistic work. And they didn't know that. We can go ahead, jump ahead to Acts 16 to the Philippian jailer. All right. And, and, and they were thrown in jail. All right. And, and instead of fussing and cussing. And being all crazy, they were singing songs at midnight, rejoicing in the Lord. Okay? All right? Then a miracle earthquake occurred. Not your typical earthquake. Because this earthquake didn't, didn't split, the, split the ground wide open. Didn't swallow up anything. It just shook and shook the, the, the bonds off the prisoners. One of them earthquakes. Okay? Jail gates open, bonds off the prisoner. Philippian jailer noted his life, he's got to pay for it with his life if the prisoners escape. So he takes out his sword and is about to commit suicide. All right? And Paul says, No, no, do yourself no harm. We are still here, we haven't gone anywhere. And then the Philippian jailer then comes and bows on down in, to Paul and says, what must I do to be saved? But not only that, he went home and got his family Say, hey, let's go, y'all. Uh, uh, We're going to get baptized into Christ today. And so what wound up happening from that experience, the Philippian church was established from that scene. And the book of Philippians that we have today was because of what happened in the jail. So now they're in jail again. Whoop de doo. <laughs> but at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out. Okay? Now, why not an earthquake here? We're dealing with Sadducees, okay? So I need you to turn to Acts 23, verse 8. Don't lose this, okay? Don't lose chapter 5, Acts 23, 8. We're dealing with Sadducees, all right? And God, God is awesome. He's something else. And he ain't wasting time. So watch this. He's dealing with the Sadducees. Acts 23, verse 8. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection and no angel or spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. That was the difference between the two. So God doesn't use an earthquake here in chapter 5 because he's dealing with Sadducees. Peter and the apostles were already preaching about the resurrection of Christ. So now God says, oh, you don't believe in angels? Huh? Watch out now. So, in verse 20, what is, verse 19, he then says, since you don't believe in angels, 
Watch what's about to happen. You Sadducees, I'm about to show you. So an angel shows up. That's why the angel, that's why we don't have an earthquake. Because God wants the Sadducees to know, you don't know who you're messing with. You don't believe in angels? Watch what's about to happen. So the angels opened up the prison doors and brought them out. Now here's our text that you, you saw in your bulletin. Our subject, verse 20. Go, stand in the temple and speak. Okay? That's our lesson for today. Go, stand, speak. To all the people, all the words of this life. What are you talking about, words of this life? When you, when you preach to people and teach them about the words of this life, you want to talk to them about Christ. Because Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. John 8, 12, he says, I am the light of the world. He that follows me should not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Jesus said, I am the way the truth and the life, all right? 1 John 5, 12 says, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. Jesus said in John 10, 10, I have come that you might have what? Life and have it more abundantly. So our job is to teach the words of this life and how do we do that teaching Jesus and the fact that he's the only one that can bring life to men and women who are separated from God that's the life we have a song we sing wonderful words of life in your song book verse 13, uh, page 13 Right, Brother Allen, from your seat, first and third verse. Let's, let's sing with Brother Allen. Wonderful words of life. Sing again to me, wonderful words of life. Good to your beauty sing, wonderful words of life. Wonders of wonderful beauty. of life is what we give to mankind. So, in verse 21, they are obedient to God and take the message that the angel gave them. And the point that I want you to understand is when we are obedient to God, you watch how God works. Amen. Verse 21, and when they had heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest and those with them came and called the council together with all the elders and the children of Israel 
and sent uh, and sent to the prison to have them brought forth. So, as Peter and, and John are preaching in the temple, the the all of the leaders. They got even the elders who had been retired from the Sadducees. I mean, this is a big deal. And they got all these people together to figure out what we're going to do with these guys. All right? So they went, sent somebody to the prison to be, to have them brought to this council of people. Okay? Now, here's the conversation that Peter and John are having, okay? They just got, got an escape through the angel of God. Now they are obedient to him, and, and there is no hesitation. They do what God wants done. Now, they know they're going to get caught again. They know that. They already know they're going to get caught again. But their perspective is this. Man, we just walked through some jail cells. I don't know what God going to do when they catch us again. But it's going to be exciting. We just walked through some jail cells. They didn't fall off. The shackles didn't come off the jail. We walked through. So when they catch us again, John, I don't know what's going to happen, but it's going to be good. So here we go. But when the officers came and did not find them in the prison, they returned and reported saying, indeed, we found the prison shut securely and the guards standing outside before the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. The officers don't even know these guys are gone because they think, hey, they ain't walked past me, so they, they, they must still be in there. I ain't seen nobody. Walk past me. Nobody could. They stay in there, right? Well, now when the high priests and the captains of the temple and the chief priests heard those things, they wondered what the outcome would be. In other words, they're at their wits' end. That word wonders, it, it really talking about them. They about to lose their mind. What are we going to do now? How do these cats get out of here? So one came and told them, saying, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple, and they are teaching the people. Them dudes y'all put in the jail, they out. How do they get out? I don't know. But they ain't here no more. They doing what God said. Then the captain.